Yeah. Um, I really appreciate this effort from the organizers. Uh, this has been a, a really uh, a treat. It was very nice talks uh, up to this point, at least. <laughs> so um, uh, today I wanted to, to discuss something that we uh, found um, about 10 years ago, I think, uh, Monchai Duangpania was a former PhD of mine. Um, and then more recently, Ziguan uh, uh, Chen, who is now a professor, full professor at Huazhong University of Science and Technology. Uh, but he was my postdoc uh, for a few years, um, uh, starting around 2014 or so. And he picked up on these things. Uh, and, and then we have some new results on this. And I wanted to share this with you. Um, this is really uh, about some what we found to be surprising connections between uh, local and non-local models. And if I were to maybe choose a different title for uh, for this talk, I probably would have called it uh, "How Numerical Approximation Errors Lead to an Exact Solution," which is a, a very strange thing. And for for a while, uh, um, many people were kind of. Uh, maybe you know, not uh, sure that we have things right, but let's go on and, and discuss what are these, what we call uh, M-convergence curves. Um, so for paradynamic model uh, that uh, we have here, um, I'm looking at the, uh, the one for elasticity, for instance. Um, if you try a uh, one Gaussian point quadrature of the integral term to approximate that integral, which is basically a, a midpoint integration, uh, you will end up with a, what's called the mesh-free, uh, the discretization of, uh, of paradynamics. Uh, and this type of discretization ends up being kind of the best for modeling uh, problems where we have evolving discontinuities, uh, fracture, corrosion, uh, damage, and so on. Um, and in terms of numerical convergence of your models, uh, you can do several things. So uh, one of them is, uh, let's say you want to improve your quadrature. So you have the horizon that's fixed and uh, you, you reduce your uh, uh, spacing of, of your grid. So you, you can have this ratio of the horizon size uh, versus the uh, uh, grid spacing. Um, and you can control this parameter. It doesn't have to be integer, right? And we call this M. And as you take M to go to infinity, right? So as you, make your discretization finer and finer, in principle, you should approach the exact non-local solution of your, uh, of your problem. So uh, that's what we, we will call M convergence. Of course, you also have um, the choice sometimes uh, uh, when you don't know that there's a specific landscape in your model, maybe you're searching for it, you can change the horizon size of the non-local interaction. Um, and that uh, if you keep the, uh, ratio, this M fixed ratio of uh, the horizon to the grid density, uh, we, we, we call that the delta convergence. And then you can do, of course, a combination of the two that uh, Professor Madenci mentioned uh, just a while ago, the delta M convergence, meaning you're shrinking the horizon, but you also at the same time increase the number of nodes inside the horizon. Um, so you can do that as well. Uh, for purposes of computational efficiency, of course, you always try to do to, or to, to use delta convergence. Uh, because that's kind of a cheaper thing. Um, if you want to, for instance, converge to the, or, or uh, see whether you recover the classical solution. As you take the horizon to go into zero, uh, again, in principle, you should um, land on the classical uh, model, the local model. So um, I'm gonna discuss uh, first the uh, diffusion, paradynamic uh, diffusion problem. Uh, so uh, you, can uh, construct a paradynamic model for diffusion. And most of the time, the kernel here, uh, it's postulated. You, you, you choose maybe a certain power for that um, denominator there. Uh, in this paper that uh, I have a list of references at the end, uh, we actually try to not postulate it, but to try uh, from physical principles, uh, basic uh, principles uh, following the way these uh, partial differential equations are deduced or the partial differential model for diffusion is deduced uh, from uh, conservation of energy principles. Uh, we, we try the same things, but to end up uh, to, with a paradynamic model. So if you follow that approach, you end up with this uh, quadratic term uh, at, at the denominator. 
Um, and this kernel has, uh, and we have shown in these papers and some follow-up papers, uh, has quite a few advantages uh, compared to other choices. Now that other choices do not have the delta M convergence, for instance, to the classical one, they all have. Um, but this one, it's um, kind of uh, gives you a few advantages. So um, what I asked uh, Munchai, my PhD student 10 years ago, I said, well, let's, uh, now we have this constructive kernel, let's see how we um, compare to the exact classical solution. Um, so you can have that uh, solution uh, obtained there. Uh, there's various ways in which you can enforce or try to approximate the local boundary conditions with a peridynamic model. Of course, a peridynamic model will have this uh, thick boundary, right? Um, and here, uh, I, I showed in A, B, C on the right side, uh, three types, a mirror type, that's actually gonna be kind of the most exact one. And then there's another one, um, you have a collar outside of your, uh, your bar um, where you, let's say you iced or you, you put a Dirichlet boundary condition there. Uh, you can also have what's called an inner type boundary condition where uh, you force the local boundary condition on this last node of your bar, let's say, okay? Um, and as the uh, M goes to infinity, so as your discretization goes to finer and finer, um, you approach enforcing the actual local boundary condition. All right, so uh, you solve, uh, this is a transient problem. So uh, in this, with these boundary conditions here, um, I have the ends iced and I start with a hundred temperature um, along the bar. Uh, then in time, that's how the temperature evolves and the paradigmic solution it looks uh, pretty close um, to the uh, classical one, um, but how close, right? So we try to look at this M convergence for different horizon sizes. So maybe a larger one here and or a smaller one. Um, and uh, we increase the grid density for uh, each of these. Um, so if you do this, um, you obtain the temperature here, I just didn't measure, measure the relative error, just the actual value of the temperature at the middle of the bar. Uh, the classical value there is about 52 Celsius um, at some time, I think this is at a certain time. Um, and um, um, when Munchai brought these curves to me, he brought them separately. He had basically a graph for each of these uh, curve that uh, shows the solution uh, depending on your fineness of the grid for various horizons. Um, and uh, of course, uh, he, he wasn't paying for the paper uh, and I asked him, well, don't do that ever again, put all 12 plots into the same <laughs> figure so we save paper, of course. Um, and when he did that, uh, we noticed something really strange and you have two sets of solutions here. One is for the, what's called the constant microconductivity. So I'm assuming that the conductivity between these bonds in the material, these pipes, if you like, that carry the heat from one node to another one, it, it doesn't depend on the, the length of it inside the horizon. Or uh, we also try the, what's called, it, we call it triangular microconductivity. So this is kind of a Gaussian, right? But simplified, ch cheaper to compute Gaussian, when, where the uh, microconductivity goes to zero towards the end of your uh, horizon size, and this is in two dimensions and so on. So you can compute this um, parameter uh, based on um, matching uh, the heat flux, let's say for a simplest case, a constant heat flux. Um, and, and the same thing happens no matter wh what you, you do here, um, you observe that all of these curves cross at uh, the same point and um, it's not gonna be hard to understand why they also have to cross this crossing point has to be, and it is the exact solution, exact value of the classical model. And that's because you do have Delta convergence. So if you keep M fixed, um, if you go down here, for instance, you go from larger horizon size with a blue to smallest. And then for, uh, we know that we have Delta convergence for this type of uh, model, um, you should converge to the exact solution. Well, on the other hand, the same happens here, but here you're starting from bottom up uh, with your non-local approximation. And this is a kind of a coarse grid, right? Um, and as your horizon decreases, you're approaching from below the classical value. Um, and if mathematically you can show that you have convergence, then if you start from one coarse end below the classical value and um, end up on the other 
you know, uh, if you like this asymptote, a horizontal asymptote there that these curves approach uh, is the value of the non-local solution for a particular horizon. So if the analytical non-local uh, solution happens to be, I mean, generally it, it does that, um, above the value of your uh, exact local solution, then, uh, then they will have to cross these curves. They have to cross at some point. Otherwise you, you, you uh, violate uh, the convergence properties, the delta convergence property. Um, but really this was kind of interesting because then it tells you that of course, we know that in the limit of the horizon going to zero, you get recover the classical solution for a non-local model. But this tells you that you can recover the classical solution no matter what your horizon is. If you use a, as large horizon as you want, but if you use this particular discretization, yeah, for that particular value of your M, the ratio of delta to delta X, you actually at a point in time along your bar, you get the exact classical solution, no matter what your size of the horizon is. So that was the, the puzzling and the shocking uh, observation we had here. So we wonder, you know, how general of a property is this? And if you, does this happen only because we had the ice conditions of Dirichlet boundary conditions at both ends or what, what if you choose a Neumann? And, and now let's look at the Neumann boundary conditions. So I'm gonna, one end, I'm gonna say no flux here at this end. Uh, and I start with the different initial conditions, 60, and it just discontinues just to try out some variation. And at early times, you don't have them to cross, but of course they kind of asymptotically, you still have the delta conversion. So that's following uh, for a fixed M, looking at what happens as the horizon changes. But after a while, you, you do uh, see the same uh, property, this crossing of the uh, and convergence curves at the exact lo uh, local solution. Uh, so that was uh, interesting, but we couldn't quite explain why it takes a while for, for this uh, to show up, this crossing, why initially you start one way. Uh, and uh, why it takes this time for, for this property to, to show up. So, um, but beyond that, in the end, you know, why should we care? Is this useful for anything? And you can see the, the use of it. Like I said, uh, you can use this uh, particular M value and depending on the uh, type of uh, kernel you have here with the constant microconductivity or triangular, you see the value is not necessarily identical. Here maybe is a little more than three. Here is closer to four or five. Um, it also may change as we'll see uh, from location. All, all of these results are at one time, at one step, uh, at one location along your bar. Um, but the property, you know, it's kind of maintained at all um, uh, at other locations as well, and in time as well, except for what I said here. I initially, see here, um, you, the, you, they don't cross, right? They asymptotically approach for a fixed horizon, the non-local one. Um, and then as the horizon goes to zero, yes, they approach the, uh, classical one, but they all come from above in this case, uh, larger values than the, the classical one. So um, the use of it is that, like I said, you can find the exact classical solution. Let's say you have a more complicated classical problem um, that may, may take you a while to compute uh, or approximate its solution. Um, then maybe you can use a non-local model with a large horizons, a couple of these, because you, if all curves and curves pass through the same location, you just need two of them to find the intersection point. And then once you have that, um, they can be for any horizon size for that fixed end that gives you a coarse grid. That's uh, basically cheap to compute. So uh, there could be a practical application for this uh, feature. Yeah, so we can basically compute the exact solution of the classical model at a point in time and space, and then you can look at other points in time and space. By using cheap non-local models, meaning cheap in the sense that they are coarse grids because you have a large horizon, so you don't have to use a very fine uh, grid. And in fact, you have to use that specific M at which these curves cross to get that, okay? So, um, but really, um, we have some understanding why it happens. Uh, and it has to do with the boundary conditions. If you remember how I imposed here this boundary condition. So I, I put ice over the first node and that node has a certain thickness. 
And that's uh, basically uh, drawing a little bit out uh, of the actual initial heat amount that I have in the bar, right? Because in the classical one, I only have it at the end of, of, the, of the bar that uh, I have zero temperature. Uh, whereas here I have over a certain thickness. So it's not um, it's hard to understand why for a large discretization, when you have these segments relatively large at the ends, you, um, your non-local solution will have a lower value. And this value is the value of the temperature of the middle of the bar, right? But because you, uh, you have artificially in a way or approx with your numerical approximation introduced this um, uh, colder uh, situation into your bar. So then you, you, your solutions will be below what the classical one will be. However, the, the analytical ones ha happen to, to be above it. So you know, that's why you have this crossing. So is this combination really between uh, your numerical approximation right, of the non-local model, the trying to approximate the classical boundary conditions uh, and the non-locality uh, itself, okay? So um, we wanted to really uh, see what really is the play between non-locality, how the boundary conditions play a role here, how is the discretization affecting these uh, phenomena. Um, and here's uh, when we try these mirror type boundary conditions where um, uh, it gives you really, if you want to impose a certain Dirichlet boundary condition at that uh, end, um, you, you do this mirror type uh, a layer outside of your body of thickness delta, enforce those uh, symmetry or anti-symmetric uh, values to end up with the um, Dirichlet boundary condition exactly at the interface. So this type of uh, boundary condition will lead to a faster uh, rate of M convergence. And you see here in these results, which again are at the middle of the bar, and I'm looking at the relative difference. The relative difference is way smaller compared to the classical result. Um, at, at all, all these times, uh, as time goes on and so on, compared to the uh, this uh, other type, that we, the inner type uh, approximation of the local boundary conditions in the non-local model. Uh, and, and you see these curves are getting flatter, so they're asymptotically um, uh, converging to the whatever non-local model you, you're actually solving, right? Much faster than before. But the same uh, feature uh, holds albeit uh, again, takes a while for it to develop. So um, at early times, everything comes, uh, the delta convergence ha happens from the um, bottom up, right? Uh, uh, towards the end, the non-local solution, the exact one, you see it, it goes from uh, values larger than the classical value. Um, so <laughs> how can we understand the, the reason for this? Uh, and really this is, um, Part of it is due to the actual non-locality itself. Um, so recently, Tiguan, what he did, uh, he actually was, was able to find analytical solutions for uh, PD uh, problems in finite domains. Um, this is a paper that's going to come out uh, uh, recently. I mean, soon. Um, so uh, now, if we have the analytical form, we can see how this solution changes with respect to the horizon size. So you can compute the derivative of it. And um, let's look at this uh, case B here. Um, in time, uh, I'm looking at the middle of the bar and plotting how this derivative of the non-local solution. And I think here we use the, uh, the mirror type boundary conditions, yeah. Uh, so the derivative with respect to the horizon size, here is the horizon size relative to the uh, length of the bar. And at some locations, um, this derivative is positive. And if it's positive, it means that as your horizon decreases, the uh, temperature also uh, value also decreases. So you basically converge from the top, from above the classical solution. As delta goes to zero, you converge to the classical solution from values above the classical one. Um, but there's a region, and you see up to some time, where uh, this uh, derivative is negative, analytically, yeah, is negative. And that's why, uh, in this case, if we look back, right? So at early times, um, I'm here, I'm just actually uh, along this line, but looking at several horizon sizes, yeah. Um, 
picking up a few values, maybe one here, one here, one here, and numerically, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, and numerically uh, computing my PD solution. So these solutions uh, I'm showing in the bottom graphs are not with the analytical one. The top figure here is based on the analytical results, but you see the correlation, right? So the numerical, this is also the numerical here. And uh, you see the separate tricks between these negative and positive regions is not vertical. So there are some uh, re uh, times where you start, uh, if you have a large horizon, you kind of start here, right? So you, your convergence, delta convergence is from the bottom up, but then eventually it crosses over as your horizon goes to uh, smaller and smaller values. Um, and then uh, you kind of have it <laughs> mixed, all right? So there's some transition there as well, but overall you can have at early times convergence of the uh, non-local solution to the classical one coming from the bottom, later on kind of from the top. Remember, this is the value of the non-local, the asymptote there is the value, the exact value of the non-local solution at that time and at that point. And these parts are related to the discretization error, okay? So really these errors at the boundaries, right? Um, help us here uh, to, um, to keep the, for, for a coarse uh, discretization, uh, to, to keep uh, the delta convergence uh, from the bottom up. And then later on, it has to be from the top, right? And therefore, these M convergence curves have to cross each other. And uh, that's when we get our M value that works for uh, obtaining the classical solution, exact classical solution, no matter what horizon size you use. Sorry, one minute left. Okay, yeah. So um, then, you know, like I said, we did this for different ways of implementing the uh, boundary conditions. And uh, you can put this to use. Um, if you want to compute the solution at all points along the bar, of course, you, you, you can see what the M value is for all, all those locations and is not necessarily constant. You see here, there's some variability at earlier times, more variability at later times, maybe less. Um, it's not very practical to do that. So then you can choose a certain value and run it with it. Um, this solution, um, it shows the non-local solution obtained from this M convergence property for relatively large horizons. And look how closer it is to the exact one, the exact value, which would have to be zero there uh, of the classical problem compared to a problem uh, or a non-local solution that uses a much finer horizon and a much finer discretization. So this is further away from the classical exact solution compared to these particular types of solutions that combine discretization and large horizons to, to get you closer to that. Uh, and then we did it for a heterogeneous bar as well. Um, yeah. you, you have the same things here. Um, if you're near the interfaces, then uh, it becomes a little, this M value becomes a little um, uh, less constant. So it has some jumps there. Uh, uh, near the interfaces, but overall you, you maintain the same uh, benefits, right? So um, does this happen beyond diffusion problems? And we tested it for elastic uh, dynamics, uh, wave propagation, you start with the pulse, uh, this black line here, and then you let it propagate. And, and if you wait long enough, um, you have them to cross here. Uh, this is for the inner type boundary condition implementation. Uh, we also try it for the mirror type, th then it's harder to, uh, to get them to intersect because the mirror type has less error. So if you don't have enough uh, um, numerical error, then it may not happen. So they may all asymptotically approach and they may not cross each other. We also did it for advection diffusion. Um, here's where they cross uh, the classical solution as well. Uh, so let me just conclude. And uh, what we found is that um, uh, this phenomenon of intersection of M convergence curves at the exact classical solution, uh, it's really uh, due to this competition of uh, effects. Um, on the one hand, you have the numerical discretization effects and couple that with the type of boundary uh, condition or the way you implement the boundary conditions in the non-local model uh, and as well as the non-locality uh, of the model. Um, and what you can see is that 
And I don't know of any other examples. You know, if you know any of such examples, please let me know. But what we, we, we get is that we use discretization error, which are related to this M quantity yeah, uh, in the non-local model to <laughs> compute exact solutions for a local model. So uh, that is really uh, striking to me at least. Uh, we also looked at these problems where you have maybe more complex um, materials. Maybe you don't have the uh, analytical solution to compare with for the classical uh, uh, problem. Uh, and then you can still do this, um, um, use this property as long as you are not that close to the uh, interface. And that's because then uh, when you, you do different materials near the interface, you have this overlap of, of um, uh, regions and, and uh, it's a little more delicate to, to uh, treat. But um, uh, what we ended up, uh, then we can say that these properties that we obtain here are indeed for the mesh dynamic implementation. They may or may not persist. We don't know yet uh, for other types of discretization, but the principles should be the same. You can uh, uh, you know, try to use these <laughs> discretization errors to find an exact solution. And with that, I, I thank you very much for your attention. And let me know if you have any questions.